as Kay said, I'm the planning director for the city of Montpelier. That includes community development and building as well. It's not just planning. And I'm also the founder of the Headwaters Garden and Learning Center, which is an eco-village we're building out in Cabot. We have five home sites available. It's a design-build kind of place, permaculture, um, ecologically sound buildings. So if you're interested in that, let me know. Now, tonight I'm going to talk about how to design your local economy. <laughs> And um, it is possible to do. We're not all victims of the global economy, and that's one of the things I've been working on in, in Montpelier. And so feel free to interrupt me if there's something I'm talking about that you don't understand. Um, but I'm going to start with getting us to think a little bit about what do we mean by the local economy? How many of you have ever had an economics class? Raise your hand. Ooh, good. So you've studied all these words you know, production and consumption and investment and savings and all these things that come to mind when we think of the economy that additionally make it a little bit intimidating <laughs> because it, it, does, it is taught like it's a fairly complex science and it's treated as if it were a science that only a very small elite understand well enough to work on. And I'm going to try and break it apart a little bit in, in new ways so that you can start to see through some of what is a fog for most people and a place where they feel powerless. So let's start with you're in my job, you're city planning and community development director and you're tasked with fostering economic development, which most people in my position in cities are tasked with doing. Why are you doing that? Why do cities care about economic development? What are they trying? What are their goals? Anybody? Taxes. Taxes? Tax base? That's good. What else? Citizens. citizens. What, what about the citizens, though? That's a goal. What is the goal for the citizens? Jobs. Jobs, 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 right. And why do we want jobs? Because we want to earn income and we need money to buy things, right? That's the way our economy works. Now, like you said, another goal of economic development is to develop a tax base for the community. That's how our small New England cities and towns work. Is everybody here from New England? Anybody not here from New England? All right, well, yours might be slightly different in New England. We have very autonomous local governments. The county governments in New England are mostly a figment of people's imagination in the past. <laughs> they don't really exist anymore. And the tax base is all local. So the local governments run on the taxes generated by the housings, businesses, and buildings in their community. So when you're talking to a city councilor or a select board, it's this tax base that they're mostly concerned with. Now, another goal that is hidden behind all of this, really, is this idea of creating wealth. That's why I called my book that, because, in fact, jobs, income, tax base, goods and services, all of that is really about wealth and how do we create a sense of well-being and wealth for our communities. Now, wealth creation, again, a lot like the economy, feels a little bit like it's out of our control and like it's a little bit magic and it's, isn't it controlled by all these big global institutions and national institutions like the Fed and all of that and it's not. So look again, if, what, is, what is wealth? Anybody have any ideas about that? Money, right? Money. That's one way of looking at wealth. Anything else? Property. Property, okay. Natural resources. Right. Happiness. Happiness. Now there's a good definition. Security. Security. All of these definitions come to mind, right? Well, the origin of the word, that word wheel, actually comes from the same root as well-being. So what is well-being? And the little TH on the end stands for possession of. So in fact, wealth means the possession of well-being. Now, when do we know we have well-being? When our needs are met. She read the book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Good answer. <laughs> when our needs are met. And what are our needs? This is not just money. How many of you know really rich people who are miserable? Who you wouldn't describe as wealthy? Even though they are. They got a lot of money in the bank, but they're miserable, right? 
and they're sick, maybe, and lost, and not, and alone. <laughs> you know, who, who wants to be like that? So we know our needs are met when we have a sense of health and well-being. That's one set of needs, right? We have a sense of empowerment and responsibility. That's a whole nother set of needs. Economic security is an important need. You know, what happens if we get sick and we need to support our kids in college? That's a real worry for most of us in the United States. We need efficient services and infrastructure. This is all the stuff that's made up for us to sleep in and get dressed and eat. You know, all of the built world comes from services and infrastructure. And of course, last but far from least, is a sense of ecological integrity. We can only live for a few minutes without air. We can only live for maybe a week tops without water. And food, maybe 40 days. We can live a long time without housing. We can live a long time without our smartphones, even though that's hard to believe. I know for most of the people in the room, I myself can't imagine living more than a day without mine. But nonetheless, people were fine before they were invented. So we, when our needs are met, and our needs are important drivers of our community economy. So once you understand that these five categories of needs, or these five community systems, essentially, that meet these needs, drive the economy, you start to see where the root of our economic lives are. Now, another important word around economic development is capital. And I'm sure if all of you are studying it yes, tomorrow, you've heard that there's more than one kind of capital, but I'm going to talk about all of them. What, what is capital? Anybody? All right, I'll walk you through it. It's not that hard. I just talked about needs. So the needs are the drivers. They're what get us up in the morning and get us to go to work and get us to places and reading books and all of that stuff. Eating. Our eating drives a lot of our activity during the day. Now the things that meet our needs are assets. So the water that I drink is an asset that meets my need for water. The job that I have is an asset that meets my need for income, right? And this is a very reliable definition of an asset, it's something that meets our needs. Capital is an asset that has the ability or the capacity to create other assets. It's the regenerative quality of the assets that really constitute the capital base. So when we put money in the bank in our current monetary system, which is a debt-based money system with positive interest as its feature, primary feature, we expect that money to grow. Compounding interest is one of the exponential functions on the planet. If you put one penny in the bank back when Jesus was born, you'd be a trillionaire by now if it just accumulated very nominal interest <laughs> and you didn't do anything with it, right? Debt and compounding debt does have an exponential function. It grows at an increasing rate. So that's where we get this idea of capital reproducing itself in the economy. But other forms of capital also have that reproductive capacity. So if we need wood and we're going to the forest for trees and we're harvesting that forest at a faster rate, then the forest can replenish itself we're undermining the natural capital of that forest, which is the ability of the forest to regenerate itself and to continue to provide us with those assets of wood. Now, there's a number of different types of capital that correspond with the different community systems that meet our needs. Social capital. The goal of social capital really is collective action, right? It's our ability to get along with other people and work with other people. Institutional capital is the institutions that we've built up over time, like our banking system and our insurance system and our governance systems. And they reproduce themselves as well through education, through institutional reproduction, essentially. And we need to look at what is at the root of that reproductive capacity to understand how to build the local economies that we want in sustainable and healthy ways. So I've Coming and talking about design, I thought, well, what are some of the principles that you might apply to economic design or currency design, which I'll talk about in a minute? And I looked at the permaculture principles, and they were interesting, although they didn't all completely apply to this. And I looked at sacred geometry, and that was interesting. And 
thought of some ways that that might apply, but I did come up with four that have worked for me. Um, one is that capital formation, or this regenerative quality of our communities, needs to, we need it in a number of different areas. We need it in our physical, for it to meet our physical needs. We need it as a way of meeting our social needs, our governance needs, and our economic needs. So we need to understand how capital regenerates itself and how it forms. We need to enhance that regenerative capacity because that's at the root of what we think about as sustainability, right? Meeting our needs today without denying future generations the ability to meet their needs. So how do we enhance that capacity? How do we maximize the emergent properties of community systems, the synergistic qualities that can go back and forth between the different types of assets and capital? And how do we integrate it all? Because in fact, that's an important permaculture principle that I think applies to our local economy is integration. We can't separate the need for economic security from our need for environmental integrity. <laughs> That's what we've been doing for the last hundred years and it's a massive failure if you haven't noticed. <laughs> Most of the global ec environmental systems are crashing right now. We need to look at how they all complement each other and how they all support each other. And also another really important feature for looking at local economies and currencies in particular is how do we match underutilized resources with unmet needs. So for example, I did a lot of work in the city of Newburgh, New York many years ago. And Newburgh is a little bit like a piece of the South Bronx moved up the Hudson River, for those of you who have never been there. It's a really depressed city. Uh, lots of boarded up homes, lots of unemployment. You might remember about a year and a half ago there was a terrorist attack in New York City that originated in Newburgh. I can believe it because just about every day the bus from the local prison comes there and drops people off in front of City Hall without any money, without any clothing, without any support systems. <laughs> and so it's a real problem city. And I just imagined what would happen if a Martian landed in Newburgh and looked around because there's all these boarded up homes and then there's all these unemployed homeless people. And the Martian might look around and say, you got all these people without housing and jobs, you have all these homes that need work, what, what's the problem here? And of course, if they went to the city officials, they'd say, well, we don't have any money. And the Martian then might say, well, what's money? Explain this money thing to me. <laughs> because he can see, you know, the problem. And money, it, it is actually the problem, as it turns out. But if we could figure out, and we did figure out a way to match the underutilized resources of human potential in Newburgh with that housing through the development of a housing currency for that city, where people could take on a youth build kind of program, apprentice with experienced developers, the city would turn these boarded up tax sale properties over to them to refurbish and through CDBG and HUD and other improvement programs fund the refurbishment of the homes, the people could earn housing credits in addition to whatever small stipend they were enabled to have through youth build and then they would be able to cash in those housing credits once the improved homes sold on the open market. It's, currency is often just a facilitator between these underutilized resources and unmet needs. So let's look at each of these community systems one by one, just to give you a sense of what I mean by capital formation and, and all of that. Now, if we're looking at enhancing our natural capital through our economy, I know this sounds almost antithetical because that's not what we've been doing with the economy for a while, but it is possible, I believe. That when we have clean air as an asset, that requires healthy forests and plants. Clean water requires healthy ecosystems to keep its reproductive capacity. Fertile soil, obviously, is created through the natural nutrient cycle. Food is made when all of these systems are working together, and in nature there is no waste. So this is some of the principles of natural capital formation. And there's a number of currencies that can be used to facilitate natural capital formation. And these currencies have been developed in different parts of the world. Not all of them have been implemented, but most of them have in one form or another. The tree savings currency is one that I'll talk about a bit. It's a good way in an impoverished area to get people to have a savings account um, for themselves and reduce the gap between the rich and the poor. Water credits, carbon credits, ecological restoration units, and biodiversity credits are all things that have been developed and deployed as trading systems 
to capture some of the value of these things in the marketplace. So the natural savings tree accounts, this is something that was developed by my co-author Bernard Leotar for India, where the city would have a plot of land and they would engage people from the community who wanted to have these savings accounts in planting trees on that land that would continue to grow. They'd make a commitment to seeing the tree growth through time. For the work on both planting and managing the trees, the people would earn these tree credits. And much like the housing credits I talked about in Newburg, the tree credits would be exchangeable for cash ultimately once the trees reach their full economic value. Those little pieces of paper, the tree credits, or they could be computer bytes and bits on a system, could also be traded with other people because you can see the trees growing. There's going to be value there someday. These tree credits will be worth that when the trees are reaching their full economic potential. And it becomes like a community savings account as well as a currency that can circulate in the community, much like bank debt money does now, as a way of making and facilitating other types of exchanges. It is an inflation-proof form of savings because it isn't based in the monetary system, which is the driver of inflation. It reduces the wealth gap between the rich and the poor. It encourages sustainable resource management, like reforestation. If suddenly everybody, yep. So you say economic value of the mature tree as when it's cut down for lumber? Well, I'll talk about that in a minute. There are a number of things that can add to the economic value of a tree in addition to its value as lumber. So we'll, I'll get to that. But yes, that is one of the values that could be harvested from that tree savings account if the community chose to do that. But because there's a number of other types of values, they also could have other ways of earning income from that tree plantation. And it available, like I said, it makes available a local medium of exchange that increases liquidity. Now, they've charted the value of the trees over time. The years are on the bottom, and the value of one tree share in work days goes up at a fairly good rate. So it's a good savings instrument. And of course, one of the other values of trees is their carbon credits. Now, there is an international carbon market, and trees' productivity of oxygen and consumption of car carbon is valued at one acre of trees for one, one ton of carbon. The carbon credits are valued in tons. Older trees tend to take in a little less of the carbon than younger trees, so you do have a declining curve on the value that can be achieved from those trees from the sale of carbon credits. But people can get carbon credits in addition to the lumber value of a tree over the lifespan of a tree. Other non-timber forest products, which are also values that could be ascribed to the tree, include fruit and nuts, medicinal plants, bark, mushrooms, all these things. Recreation, hunting and fishing, all of these things are things that produce economic value in the community that are the result of, of healthy trees and healthy forests. So if you add it all up, the trees could be a really valuable source of savings and economic activity in communities that take them very seriously and use them for all of these values. So the total tree value would be its carbon value, the hydrological value from the water quality that is developed because of the forest, biodiversity value, timber values, non-timber products, and I'm suggesting that the savings would mature after all of these values are put to use, and it was sustainably managed forest for all of these values, which would make it even more than the mature lumber value. Now, as I mentioned, the, the Hydrologic value is another one that has been developed and is now traded in around the world for watershed payments in the water quality trading systems. I've been working on a series of workshops for Indonesia, and in Indonesia, just in, nine, in 2008, I think there was over there was many thousands of dollars of these water quality trading going on there and, and adding value to the community for effective watershed management. It was a 9.3 billion market, dollar market worldwide in 2008, because we're starting to recognize that the value that we have in our water quality, reproductive, natural capital is really hard to replace and is actually worth something. And so that's where these trading schemes are coming from. 
Water privatization is obviously a serious concern worldwide. Uh, Coke and Pepsi have been buying up municipal water supplies all over the world, as have many other big multinational corporations with the tacit and overt support of the UN and other big international institutions. I can't tell you how reprehensible I find water privatization because I think it essentially privatizes and puts in the profit market it's something that we all need as a basic human function. We can live without oil. We lived without oil for millions of years. We can't live without water for more than a couple weeks. It should be a publicly managed commons that is a human right, not a profit center for other corporations. But that's just my view. <laughs> um, another form of ecological natural capital formation is obviously in the carbon trading schemes that have been invented. Here again, I'm not advocating cap and trade or carbon tax, but I'm basically showing you how it can work to help mobilize a currency that would enhance whatever the carbon costs and carbon trading that is going on are. Essentially, this was designed for the city of Sacramento because out in California, they've had cap and trade now for several years and that drives the carbon market nationally. But the thing about trading on the carbon market is you need to be a fairly big business or a big institution to do it because the costing of it and the auditing of it is very expensive. I looked into it for the city of Montpelier when I've been developing this district energy plant to see if we could get more money for the district energy plant through carbon markets. And the, it's prohibitive for even a city our size to do that. And so percolating that market down to the individual level is a challenge. And yet it can be done through the development of a currency. So let's say individuals change their transportation habits, tighten up their homes in ways that are measurable and marketable on the carbon market. They would then earn this carbon currency. Again, bits and bytes on a computer or pieces of paper or something that show that they had made that improvement or taken that, tack, taken that bus or ridden that bike, whatever they're doing. That carbon currency could be traded for purchases in businesses that have something to do with the carbon market. And what business doesn't? Every business has some type of transportation involved or some type of environmental impact. Businesses could also use the currency for trade with other businesses in the carbon scheme. And the, the businesses and the institutions that consolidate the carbon markets and that have these auditable records and trading abilities, that's where you'd redeem them for real dollars. So ultimately, this currency would have a real dollar value, but it could percolate down to lower levels um, without needing to have the individuals and the small businesses do it. And of course, some of that redemption is intentionally retired by environmental groups like the Sierra Club that are active now in the carbon market to retire the credits and lower the overall carbon impact and others is traded in local offset markets or global carbon markets for people that are looking for that sort of thing. So that's how carbon currency could work. And of course, uh, another currency that's been developed, again, I'm back in natural capital. How do we enhance our natural capital through the development of currencies? How do we design our local economies to enhance natural capital instead of eroding it? This was one that was developed for the Shiga prefecture in Japan called the Biwa Kipu system. The Shiga, Shiga Prefecture is on this big lake. The lake had a real problem with invasive species, a lot like milfoil and some of the things we're struggling with here. They developed a new ordinance that mandated that households had to pay a tax, essentially, in Biwa Kipu. Kipu in, Chinese, in Japanese means ticket. And Biwa was just the ticket you got for harvesting this invasive species in the lake or doing some other ecological restoration projects. Now, the fact that everybody had to pay the tax, everybody wasn't going to go do this harvesting, but that the fact that everybody had to pay the tax meant that people who weren't doing the harvesting would go pay the people who were in yen so they could get these tickets to hand in as this additional tax. The taxation function of government, and this is going to be one that is going to be a little hard to get your head around, is actually the main Thing, the main reason the government uses tax is to value the currency, to value the national currency. That's its main purpose, more than it is revenue generation. If the U.S. government decided tomorrow that you could pay your taxes in pencils, pencils would suddenly get a lot more valuable. 
The fact that we are so invested in the dollar system is because the dollars are the only legal tender. Legal tender means the currency that the national government says is what we use to pay all taxes and debt. That's what legal tender means. So if you go to pay a debt in dollars and they refuse your money, that debt is legally canceled. If you go to pay your taxes in dollars and the local government refuses money, your taxes are legally canceled because that's the coin of the realm. So if we could enact other forms of tax that supported other community goals like environmental restoration, arts, culture, all of those sorts of things. So the municipality says, all right, we want, to, you, we want you to give us 10 art credits, 10 design credits every year. That would suddenly make the people who do that work a lot more valuable to the community as a whole because people would pay them in money to get the tax they needed to pay the municipality for that thing. And that's, that's how these ecological restoration currencies work. So that's natural capital formation, which is, as I said, one of the most important ones because it's our human life support system. Human capital formation is another really important thing. This is how we're educated, how we are healthy, how we develop a sense of self-esteem, how we have participation in our governments, how we have a sense of meaningful work and have the skills that we need to do a regular job. The assets in human capital are things like health, intelligence, strength, creativity, ethics, and character. Can anybody think of stuff I've missed? What other things might you consider the assets that we have in our human development, our human potential? And then these, the things on the, the right are the things that we need in our communities to make sure that these assets are developed. So how do we introduce currencies, or how does the economy support this instead of undermining it, which it also does today pretty badly? One of the ways to do that is time banks. Has everybody here heard of time banks? Raise your hand if you have. We have two of them in Montpelier that are about to be one again. One is called the Onion River Exchange, and the other is called Reach. They're used for anything you can spend time on. And people actually trade time with each other instead of money for goods and services. So the little cartoon here says, Einstein discovers that time is actually money. Now in Japan again, there's been this system in place for the last 17 years now called furai kippu. Remember, kippu means tickets. <laughs> furai means caring relationships. So these are caring relationship tickets and they're used in Japan for elder care. So if you live in Osaka and your parents live in Tokyo, you can, use, you can take care of an elder couple in Osaka and earn these tickets for the time you spend with that older couple. And then you can send the tickets to Tokyo and somebody there will take care of your parents in the same way you've done in Osaka. It's an elder care program. As I said, it's been in existence for over 17 years. It's, it's largely run by the labor unions there. And they've done several evaluations of it. And it always comes up in the evaluations that people value the services they get through the Furai Kippud system as higher quality than what they pay yen for. Now, why might that be? That this system of furai kippu, elder care, is, dis is decidedly, again and again, valued as higher quality than what they can pay yen for. Yeah? Seems uh, self-selective. Like the people who are gravitating toward this model are people who have the care. <laughs> and they, and because the people in the work are not caring. That's a really good answer, because that's actually really the truth of it, that the people that are caring for elders in their community, hoping to exchange them for their parents' care, or somebody else they know somewhere else, you would assume are going to treat those older people the same way they hope their parents will be treated. They are a broader group of people. They're not just people that are on the low end of the wage earning scale. Think of the people, even in our country, that are paid to do elder care. They're not always the highest skilled, highest paid people in the community, au contraire. <laughs> they are often borderline marginal themselves because it's such low paid work. Why is it low paid work? It's low paid work because we need it in abundance and it's skills that we have in abundance. And our monetary system values things that are scarce. It doesn't value things that we need and have in abundance. So 
the dollars and the yen, which are this particular type of money that go to pay for elder care, pay for very low quality care. And the exchanges that happen using these tickets are much higher quality. It's just the way the two systems work. Now in Montpelier, we've developed, I said, two, two time banks. One is a care bank called REACH, which I got a grant from the Administration on Aging to implement. And it's a basically an elder care program, a lot like the J Japanese Furai Kipu system. But it's not just elders that are in the program. Um, lots and lots of people in the community are. People receive assistance and certain services in exchange for time, again, rather than money. And we set it up to be like a health care premium. So instead of just being like a marketplace, which most time banks are like, you'd, we tried to get it so people would pay a, a monthly tax, essentially, in dollars to help maintain a level of service and staffing that could help maintain the elder care system. As I said, it's not just elders that are involved in REACH. Lots and lots of people in the community are. The interesting thing for me that I didn't anticipate when I set the program up is how strong a support system it would turn out to be for our disability community. They've gotten very involved. And there's lots of people that, that in that community can do for elders and vice versa. And, and that's turned out to be a really positive element of it that I hadn't anticipated. And everything under the sun is offered using time as an exchange. Anything you spend your time on is fair game in a time bank. They're very easy to set up. All you need really is the computer software, which you can, it's an open source platform developed by Time Banks USA. It costs $50 to download from the internet. You get a little instruction book that goes with it. And you, it's fundamentally a community organizing task more than it is a technical task to, to get it going. You need to get people in there that are going to be doing things like instrumental music and cardio exercise and companions and rides to the doctor. Rides are a big one in Montpelier. Yep. Is, is an hour equal to an hour or is it yes. in, like a brain surgeon versus somebody shoving? An hour is equal to an hour is equal to an hour. The one benefit of that system, one big benefit, is it makes it tax exempt. So everything that you earn and spend in a time bank is not added to your income calculations, which is critical for people who are living below the poverty line or elders who are living on fixed income because you don't want these services to tip them over the breaking point for Medicaid, Medicare, affordable housing, et cetera. Um, and it also establishes that fundamental value of all humans in the community. You're not different. You're not discriminated against because you aren't a brain surgeon. Brain surgeons, after all, need babysitters from time to time. One of the important things about complementary currencies, like time banks, is the complementary part. We're not suggesting that the entire economy could run on a time bank. But things that we need in that economy that require care and human development are good candidates for this type of currency to be used. Now, education currencies are another form of currency that has been developed in two countries by, again, my co-author, Bernard. One was in Brazil called the Saber, and the other was when Lithuania decided to become a learning community. And in both of these cases, in Brazil it was when a phone tax, when the new cell phones came out and they decided to tax them, and they wanted to make sure that these things that they were convinced would undermine their children's <laughs> educational prospects would be taxed and contributed to their education, which is a great idea. So the tax for the cell phones went to this big education fund, and they wanted to maximize how that fund would work. So they basically allowed young people to earn education points or education credits when they tutored their younger peers. The, um, at the end of their high school careers or their secondary education, they could then trade in their points to this fund to pay for college. So it turned into this um, marvelous way for people in low-income households to pay for their college once they got through. So it helped distribute the college funds and gave some startup peop to people who needed it. And the same type of system was implemented in Lithuania. This learning pyramid, too, is another feature of the education currency because what I'm doing right now, the lecture, that's that very top very small percentage. You all might retain 5% of what I say tonight. Maybe. <laughs> right? But if you were teaching it to the group instead of me, you'd retain 90% of it. 
So having children turn around and play as tutors to their peers is also a very effective educational program, in addition to being a way to mobilize these, the, these monies and maximize the value that came out of the money generated by the tax or in, in Lithuania by the, the Doraland Foundation. Wellness tokens are another type of human capital development currency or human capital formation currency. This is another um, system that Bernard developed for healthcare where people could earn wellness tokens when they take on preventative measures and then use those tokens to pay down their health insurance premiums. It's a way of getting credit for being healthy in a system that essentially is a sickness management system <laughs> rather than a healthcare system. So as you make yourself more healthy, your insurance premiums go down because these wellness tokens help you pay them down. It also isn't a punitive system. It's a reward system. You know, people often will say, well, when are we going to start charging people that smoke cigarettes more money for their health care or who are eating too many fatty foods or whatever it is that are causing these long-term health problems? Well, Punitive doesn't really work, and it's not really right in our system, but this would reward people that are doing healthy things. So you could get points if you quit smoking <laughs> instead of being penalized for having um, that kind of bad habit. What happens though if you, if you start smoking to then quit smoking to get points? <laughs> well, you'd obviously have to figure out ways to yeah. avoid gaming the system as you set it up, right? But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd consider you be kind of stupid to do that, just to earn points to get off your health insurance, right? Yeah, I, guess, I mean, I guess the question <laughs> that is, is with some of these systems that are in place, even if it's only for a few years, have instances arise where people try to... Game it. Interestingly enough, that's a really interesting question because, in fact, in most complementary currency systems that are not associated with debt and positive interest, there isn't a big incentive to cheat. Like the time banks, for example, it's run completely honor system. You actually don't pay somebody to do something for you. You go into their account and you debit them online. Now you'd think that would be fraught with all kinds of cheating, but it's just not. We have very, there's very little conflict, there's very little cases where people disagree with something, somebody charged them and want to lower the price. The one case that I mediated myself in the first year of operation in the Onion River Exchange was a case where in fact the guy wanted to pay money to the woman who gave him a service, but she didn't want to accept the money because she was saving up her points for a quilt for her grandchild. It, was, it, was, it required a lot of hours. She was driving him to Montreal for a performance. So it was, it was a lot of time dollars, and he was going to have to go negative. And you know, none of us like to go into debt. But in the time bank, it doesn't matter. You can go into debt. As long as you work your way out, as long as you don't go way into debt and leave nothing behind, you know, then the coordinator will contact you and have you come in and do some volunteer work in the office. But because you're not being penalized for being negative, it's not a, there's no interest charged for the debt. It's all you know, so there isn't cheating. The, the motivation for cheating and gaming the system arguably is a function of our monetary system. It isn't necessarily a human condition. So how do we enhance built capital? with different types of currency. You know, these are the assets that we need. We need farms, we need buildings, factories, products, services, roads, waste system. All of these things are our assets in the built capital area. And what do we need? We need skilled labor. We need collective action, materials, fi financial resources and markets. You can start to see how there is a real synergy in these areas, too. Um, well, one system that's been in existence since the 1930s that has a very good track record in this area is called the Veer in Switzerland. It stands for Wirtschaftsring, which means working circle, essentially, in the country. It was developed by Swiss businessmen during the last Great Depression, <laughs> where they had the same problems there. Banks were pulling back credit lines, loans weren't available, the economy was going down. And the business guys all got together and said, well, you know, the main reason I need that loan from the bank is so I can pay you for your materials because I'm not going to be paid by my customers right away. Most business involves this kind of cash flow gap where you have to pay for your materials and labor before you collect the money from your customers. So there's always that gap that bank debt money comes right in to fill. Well, the businessman said, why don't I just issue you the debits and credits myself? We don't have to charge interest for it. 
but I'll, you know, I'll buy your materials, I'll give you these credits. You can use those credits to buy something else in this circle system. Worked great. Oops, sorry. So nowadays, 75% of the small and medium-sized enterprises are members of the VIR system. Lots of billions of francs in transactions happen every year that you can use it to buy real estate in Switzerland. You obviously can't use it to buy fossil fuels offshore. So generally, businesses will prefer to be paid in francs rather than VIR because they can spend it anywhere. But when the economy goes south, they're happy to take the VIR. And they've actually shown through several economic studies that the VIR existence has a counter-cyclical Im impact on their economy in Switzerland. You know, when the economy goes down, the use of the VIR goes up. When the economy goes up, the use of the VIR goes down. But it keeps people employed. It keeps the Swiss economy moving along. The Swiss economy is better than the rest of Europe, not because of their chocolates and their watches. <laughs> it's really partially because of the existence of this dual currency that they have. And we, good news is we have that same dual currency here in Vermont. It's through the Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. It's called the VBSR Marketplace. Hundreds of members statewide and businesses in Vermont are using these debits and credits on the computer to trade with each other rather than money. Saves them money, helps businesses out, keeps people employed during economic downturns. Now another currency I've developed but not yet implemented in Montpelier is a food currency. And I think this is an important one for Vermont that um, people are starting to take interest in. There's lots of members. It's just I really need an entrepreneur who wants to take it on because I'm very busy and I don't have time to develop it to the point it needs to be developed. But the point of the food currency is to drive food in storage. We need more food in storage in Vermont. You because need storage? Food in storage. You need the physical storage. We need the physical storage space and the physical food in that physical storage space, what yes. That's a good possibility for somebody who might like to run the system. Because the way it works is... Like if I had 10,000 square feet of storage space, what that would be That would be great. That would be great. Come and talk to me tomorrow in my office. Well, not tomorrow, but maybe Friday in my office. <laughs> because that's who we need. That's what we need is somebody who has the storage space who wants to take on this business. It's a business model, essentially, where people would pay dollars to put food in storage. Now in Vermont, 95% of our food rolls in on trucks every day. That means we are very vulnerable to energy disruptions and transportation disruptions. In February, if the energy or transportation sector broke down, we would be hungry in no short time. You know, three days of food is about what we have in storage right now. And we've seen ice storms that can make a bigger problem than that for our communities. Irene! isolated communities last year. In fact, there was a great story from Stockbridge about this family who had taken this food storage idea very seriously. They had enough food and storage for their family for the entire year. They went through it in a week, feeding their neighbors in Stockbridge because nobody else had the food and storage. Trucks couldn't get into town. Both of the bridges into town were blown out. They, didn't, they weren't able to get people in or out of there for several weeks. That same thing could happen to us. And so I've been preaching this. We need more food in storage. We need more root cellars. We need storage units. We need people to buy food in storage. The food would be put in the storage, and you'd get a chit, you know, a little piece of paper, <laughs> that was worth that rice and beans sitting in her 10,000 square foot barn. You could spend that chit with somebody else because they know that they can go to her barn and get the food. Or they could spend it at the restaurant, and the restaurant knows it could go to the barn and get the food. Or it could spend it on its workers who know they could, you know, I mean, the food in storage could turn out to be like our gold standard. <laughs> I mean, only it'd be a 100% reserve system instead of a fractional reserve system, which would make it more robust and actually healthier for all of us who need the food. So that's how it works. And then, um, the, so the food storage units, those little chits you got for buying the food in storage, with real dollars, again, would be one layer of the currency, the food currency. The second layer could be a food credit system that would be built on top of that. Because anytime you have a trusted network of exchange relationships like you'd have with this food storage, you could just start trading debits and credits with people in that system on top of the food storage units, and, and that could work that way too. Loyalty currencies are another form of complementary currencies that help our businesses and help our built capital. Um, we all know these as frequent flyer miles, right? There are more frequent flyer miles in existence in the world than there are dollars. Little known fact. <laughs> and you can trade them for a lot of things. You can trade them for hotels and cars and 
you know, other tra uh, trains and planes. Um, now, if we had loyalty currencies that are combined on a local level, so that any time you go into your local store to buy something, you get a point, punch card point for just being there, and you can spend that anywhere in your community instead of that one little coffee shop. <laughs> I remember one time I was giving this lecture, and a guy pulled out the whole fistful of different little punch cards that he had from all the little stores in the community. It was just like a, you know, a fan of them. Well, what about combining all of them and allowing all the shops to trade among themselves? That would be another good way of introducing a currency on a local level that would support your local businesses. So social capital formation. It's a little different than human capital formation, but obviously they're very closely related. You know, if you build time banks, you build social capital too. You're not just building human capital. And um, this requires cooperative structures, freedom from oppression, trust, freedom of assembly, freedom of speech, media, and communication. We take all of these things for granted in the United States. I've worked, though, in a lot of countries where they're not taken for granted. And I can tell you how important <laughs> social capital formation is where these things break down. You know, I worked a lot in Central and Eastern Europe after the changes there and in South Africa after the changes there. And, you know, these things have broken down there and it takes actual conscious efforts to rebuild them. So I, I, I've come to appreciate what it takes to keep social capital at work. Because if we lose this capacity, we lose our collect ability to take collective action. And that's actually, you know, in the interest of the people that would like to keep us as passive consumers that buy all sorts of products without even thinking about it. <laughs> you know, the more we do things collectively, the, the healthier we all are. So this is an example, the Balinese Narayan Banjar. This is a form of social currency that's existed for millennia in Bali. And it, it means work for the local community. It's a lot like a time bank. In addition to whatever you're doing in the money economy, you are expected to contribute to your Banjar, which is like your local neighborhood. Oh, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, oh, hurry up. <laughs> I know it's hot in here. So. Um, all the ceremonial activities, like funerals and weddings and other things that people do, are um, paid for and supported through this Banjar system. So there's this really interesting story about this guy in Bali who got rich. Like he was the Bill Gates of Bali. And he didn't think he needed to do this Banjar system anymore. After all, he had all his money to pay people. Well, he died. And nobody came to his funeral. Can you imagine that? If Bill Gates died and nobody came to his funeral, what the Banjar system was how the funerals were done. He hadn't contributed to it all of his adult life. He didn't have any credits there. And so he had a very small, impoverished funeral. That's how important it is to them. So I know all of this sounds probably like pie in the sky and fantasy world, but it isn't, in fact, because this is the number of these type of currencies that have been developed all over the world for the last 40, 30 years. You can see that it's on an exponential growth curve. All over the world, these new forms of currency are coming into use, coming into existence, and they're working. They're growing. This is an exponential growth curve. This is a positive reinforcing cycle going on here, and it has to do with the fact that they actually do something for the communities where they're introduced. Countries all over the world have complementary currency systems. Um, not everywhere yet, but they are growing. This is even an old map. We have a lot of them in the United States. There's a lot of commercial barter systems here. There's, a, a lot of, there's time banks all over the country now. So it's not as if this is pie in the sky exactly, although it is hard to get complementary currencies going. I won't deny that. I've, I've had a struggle myself, but we, we have successfully introduced several now in our area. Again, they break down into a couple different types. There's social purpose currencies, which are the type I was talking about that develop social capital and human capital. Um, they're generally for things that um, are tax exempt or supported by governments. And then there's commercial purpose, purpose currencies. We talked about those too, the, the commercial barter, the business loyalty, and, and fiat currencies. Fiat currencies are what most people think about when I start talking about complementary currencies. They think of those paper notes that circulate just like dollars in communities. They're actually not the most common anymore and aren't the ones I recommend. These are hard to develop, hard to manage. Taking care of all those notes circulating in the community, you actually need somebody to manage them for inflation to make sure there's not too many of them. So the first one, the one in Ithaca that was developed called the Ithaca Hour, 
is managed by an economics professor at Cornell. <laughs> That's why it's so successful. But other places that have developed these type of currencies, there's the Ithaca Hour up there, um, have not always had as much luck. In fact, Burlington Bread, down here in the lower corner, is not in existence anymore. It was just too hard to manage. And it, oops, sorry. Um, it actually pooled in different businesses because there weren't quite enough things to spend it on in Burlington. So I don't recommend these kind, but you can see there's a lot of them that circulate. Now, how do local currencies work? Um, mutual credit systems are the type that I talked about, like time banks or commercial barter, where you're basically trading debits and credits online, or the currency comes into existence at the moment it's needed. Fiat currencies are notes that circulate like dollars. Time banks actually can be as simple as a blackboard in an elder care home. They don't have to be complicated. And there are often several options, depending on the audience or the purpose. So you can use a lot of different mechanisms to implement them. And I describe all of those mechanisms in a little book you can download for free on my website. Another important thing to think about when you're developing the currencies is this idea of a circular flow of exchanges in the community, so that there's a place for everybody to spend them. So you want to make sure that if, if people are earning them, that they can spend them back into the system and that, that there's a fair balance there. And that, as I said, with a time bank is fundamentally a community organizing task. You want to get a lot of people who have a lot of things to offer. You don't want 100 people in there that all want their house cleaned. <laughs> you know, that doesn't get you there. You know, you've got to have people who want to clean houses and people who want their house cleaned. People who want rides, people who can offer rides. So before you even put it all online and have your launch party, I recommend you recruit about 50 people and make sure you're recruiting people that have complementary skills and talents and abilities. And all of this is to develop what I call an ecosystem of currencies. We have a monoculture of currency right now. It's called the bank debt money system. And the bank debt money system is a destructive system. It is actually largely responsible for the growth imperative that is driving. It's the foot on, I, one of my things in the book is, if, the, if it's the invisible hand of the marketplace, the bank debt money system is the invisible foot on the accelerator toward our mutual destruction. Because, and I explain this in more detail in the book if you're interested, because the positive interest function of money drives the growth imperative. Companies need to continue to make profit at an increasing rate to keep up with the cost of money. Because money, all money is issued through the issuance of debt. And it all comes into existence through that issuance of debt with its positive interest rate. We all think we're still back in the gold standard days, that money has a real value somewhere, but it doesn't. It's all debt. I think the interesting thing is every, uh, I'll say nearly every slide that you put up there, you talk about assets. Everything is something asset or currency asset or something like that. The debt-based system is not an asset, it's a debt. -based it's a debt-based system. system. It's the opposite of it. All countries. In the world, this is the main monetary system. We don't have alternatives. And it's almost like we've developed blinders to the fact that there are plenty of alternatives. I've just described a handful of them, but there's many more than this. And bank debt money served a purpose in the industrialization era because it does serve the purpose of consolidating wealth and power. That's what it does best. It's like a giant sucking sound upward. If you, if you hear the Occupy movement and they talk about the 99%, the reason the 99% is the 99% is because of the monetary system. Most of them don't understand that, but it's true. Um, so it consolidated wealth and power in fewer and fewer hands, and that enabled industrial development, which has brought us to the world we're in today. There aren't, it's not all bad. The, the bad part is that it's all we're using. What we really need is a system that has more diversity to it, so it's not the only thing that provides us with community value.